So we're about two or three minutes before we go live, and um, I usually wait till we get to exactly seven o'clock. And then I will welcome everybody. But if you're already here, you could say hello. You could go to the chat if you're watching this via YouTube in your browser, you could go and say, hello, hello, everybody, and tell us where you're joining from. And question, do you, do you have any bits of old or, or just dead tech technology that you just can't bear to let go of because you just never know when it's going to be useful? Have you got one of those big boxes full of old PSUs, power supplies for just that one day when it, you never know, it might, you might just need a 13.7 volts, uh, 220 milliamp PSU with a very, very unusual adapter on the end. Okay, so I've just pressed the record button, and now this is the point where I'm going to say good evening, everybody, and welcome to our November 2021 online jam, our jam. We call it our jam. We used to call ourselves Preston Raspberry Jam way back, you know, July next year. We'll have been running these jams for 10 years. These online jams, the our jams that we call them, we started running these in April 2020, the first month after we went into the lockdown. So that means this is our 20th online version of the jam. Um, you'd have thought by now we'd have figured out how to do it properly. So there's a team of people in the background here and there and everywhere. Some of them are you at home watching this. Some of some people help steer and guide us in the right direction. We've got some presenters lined up tonight and we have a special guest who we will be traveling over to the town of Todmorden shortly to go and visit. Um, before we go into that, there's a couple of things I want to mention. So um, I'm hoping that you're watching this live on YouTube because you can go into the little chat on YouTube and you can type messages in there like, hey, everybody. And if you see things that are interested, you, you know, you know so, say that. Um, we record these jams every month. This one's been recorded. All the previous ones have been recorded up, up the other 19. And we have a playlist on the EXA Foundation YouTube channel. That's exa.is forward slash channel. And if you go there and find a playlist, you can watch a whole archive of all of them. And we've timestamped them all as well. So, you know, if you want to go and see the one where Gary's robot was doing an impression of Brian May playing the guitar, you don't have to go and watch in minutes and minutes of me talking. You can just click on that timestamp and go straight to it. And one of the reasons why we've done that is we, we, we have some teachers who watch these events and want to show and share some of it with their classes. So like, for example, last month, our special guest was Lorraine and we went to we went down into our basement. We went up her stairs. So you could, if you wanted, just find that link and share that and make use of it. Now, um, next month is December, and so people go all festive. So we've already had a few suggestions about what our theme may be for next month. And I've got wondering and, and thinking about whether we should go back and do one of those collaborative jams that we've done online. We did one last year. We haven't done one this year where we all come, we're, we're here, and then we set a project, and then people go away in their houses and Maybe they get bits of cardboard or computers or scratch, whatever, and build and develop things. And then at the end of the jam, we show. And one suggestion from Gary has been, we could call it 
Christmas reinvented. I kind of, I, I love that. I think that's a great I, I, idea for a jam. So um, when I publish the event, it'll probably be tomorrow or the next day or two that you can book your tickets online. Some people have, have gone to Eventbrite, they have clicked favorite or subscribe or something like that. So as soon as those events go live, they usually book these tickets straight away. But for those people who don't, I usually send an email invitation. And in the email, you click on a thing, except some people say, we never get those email invitations. Ah, it's probably going into your spam or you never gave us the correct email address. Yeah, yeah I know who you are. Yeah, I, I saw what you did. <laughs> so, or the other thing you can just do is if you follow our Twitter account on Twitter, <laughs> it's Preston R. Jam, then you, you, you can click on there and you can usually find links. Now, um, in a moment, we're going to start with our lightning talks. Um, I do want to move on to, to talk about one topic, which is a bit of a difficult topic for me. Um, we sadly, we learned the news recently, about two weeks ago, that we lost one of our community, um, Carl Wally. Very, very tragic accident, and um, you, you may have heard. And um, uh, like for, uh, the very from early on when I met Carl, Carl was working on a project. He was passionate about Android, and for years I've had this object on my desk, which which I've always treasured, but I will treasure it just a little bit more now. But um, Carl started coming to our jams when we had our very first one back in July 2012, and he regularly presented. In fact, I've got a, if I just do a quick share screen, let me show you, I could, I've got some photos, because sometimes they, which Carl was he? Because we've had a few Carls that have, have joined in our jam. So just give me a moment and I just put, some, I've got a little photo album. I went back and found some photos. Um, sometimes when Carl did presentations, there we are. So this, this one, this is when we're up in the media factory, um, now, Carl was Carl loved the Android operating system and he loved developing things and he was so passionate and enthusiastic about encouraging other people to do that. Um, he, we've, I've, I've gone back and looked at photos from our previous events. He's nearly always there somewhere. If he's not up on the stage presenting, he's somewhere set in the audience. And um, and you may have already heard about this. If you if you look on our Twitter account, we, we, we tweeted something about this um, a week or two ago. Now, if you want, there is a, a way you can help. The, 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 there is a, his family have started a Just Giving page. And what I'm gonna do in a moment, is I'm gonna copy that link there, that URL, and I will post that in. So um, it was very, very sad circumstances. There's actually, there was actually an explosion at the house and the family have literally lost everything. Not only have they lost a dad and husband, but um, all of their possessions as well. So if there's anything, if there's any way you can find it in your heart to, um, to donate to that, let me put that link into the chat. And then, um, so I'll just type in the word just giving, and then you can find that on there. So, um, we are okay now um we have a few lightning talks lined up tonight we're we're gonna head over in a moment to lee i know lee is a fan of using old tech and he's gonna share us with us uh, some of his insights into that then we have gary gary has also managed to cobble something together very very quickly last minute literally and um and then we may have one or two others to share depending on how we're doing for time and then we're going to go over to todd Madden makes me session. sound really well prepared doesn't it <laughs> yeah so um so lee um what i'm going to do now is i'm going to change the video so it spotlights your camera for everyone and i'm going to mute my own microphone i haven't actually heard you do you want to say something hello everyone perfect uh, just share the screen. There we go. Go ahead of myself. Right. Well, as Alan was saying, I uh, enjoy making stuff, but I enjoy repairing old stuff as well. And uh, a lot of that old stuff seems to be old computers and old games consoles. So for tonight's talk, and mostly because I've got photos of it from a couple of years ago, I thought I'd talk about repairing an old Atari 2600 games console. So a couple of years ago, I was looking on uh, eBay 
and I saw an old Atari 26 game console like I used to play when I was a young lad. I didn't actually own one at the time because they were horrendously expensive. It belonged to a friend of mine called Julian. Hello, Julian, if you're out there. And it was going fairly cheap on eBay. I can't remember how much, 20 pounds or so. So I thought, ah, that'll be good. And it was listed as worked last, last time it was used. So I thought, oh, that'll be excellent. So I paid for it and up it turned a week or so later. And of course, it didn't work. It didn't work at all. All it gave was a black screen, which this is what it looked like. But yes, just a black screen, nothing. So I took it apart and it looked something like that, although it was a lot dirtier. But after a good clean and a thorough inspection, everything looked absolutely fine, um, which was quite annoying. annoying. Just going to uh, pause Lee, here for a moment, was... Lee. I think you're sharing your notes and you're oh, I... something else you want us to see. Ah, I do apologise. Yeah, I'm I thought well, this shared, is an interesting I'm way clearly of clearly shared the wrong thing. Let's <laughs> so, try that again. So we can How go about back... that? Is that better? Um, now I can see your photos. Ah. Right, so that's that's the Atari 2600. And this is how it looks when you open it up. Like I say, it was a lot grottier and dirtier inside. So I took it apart and put lots of new capacitors into it. And it still didn't work, unfortunately. So I thought the only thing to do was to buy another Atari 2600 in the hope that I could use one to work out the problem with the other. So the second Atari 2600 appeared a couple of days later and I turned it on and guess what? It still didn't work. So I did exactly the same thing with that. Opened it up, cleaned it all out, recapped it, looked at it in minute detail. No, nothing. So by now I'm in so deep, I thought there's only one way forward. Yes, you guessed it to buy a third Atari 2600. So that turned up a week or so later. Unfortunately, this one worked. Well, I say worked, it kind of worked. You could just about see a picture on the screen when you put a games cartridge into it. But at least that was a bit of progress. So using the third one or the chips from the third one, because having done some Googling, it turns out that a lot a lot of black screens are caused by chipset issues. I took all the chips out, cleaned all the legs, put them all back in, but that hadn't helped. But as the last one worked, I took the chips out of that and stuck them into the first two. And by a process of elimination, I worked out that it was the TIA chip, which is fairly infamous in Atari circles, it turns out. It's the television interface adapter chip, which actually generates the pictures So that got them all working, but the pictures that it was actually generating on the screen were absolutely horrible. Um, that's the TIA chip there, the big, big one on the right hand side of the screen. So I sent off for some new TIA chips. Well, I say new, they were 40 years old at this point, had been sat in a box on a shelf somewhere, but fortunately they were still available and set about building video amplifier circuits, which is this little thing here in the middle of the screen. And taking lots of bits out of the motherboard and hacking around with it, this amplifier basically replaces the RF modulator that you used on old CRT TVs to tune the picture in. And this replaces it with a stronger composite signal so that you can actually see the games that you're playing. Uh, where am I in my notes? Yes, there were other problems with it as well. It turns out that once you can see the picture, you still couldn't actually play the games. Oops. Because these big switches on the top of the screen where you select the game and restart the games, most of those didn't work either. So they need to be stripped down, cleaned out, sprayed with lots of contact cleaner, and got working again but eventually all that was working with all three of them so there's all three of the lids having been taken off and scrubbed in the shower 
to get all the dirt and muck off them. So next came oh, those are the switches. Yep, yeah. had to take on this particular one. I had to take all the switches off completely because they weren't working. But finally, we got to the controllers. So you could start the game and you could see the picture in glorious detail, but you couldn't actually play the games anymore because most of these old joysticks were shot, which I do remember from when I was a young lad that the plastic inserts on them break very easily when you get enthusiastic <laughs> playing Pac-Man. So uh, back to eBay to buy more spare parts and more joysticks. Eventually got a set of those working. And then on to the last thing was the paddles for playing breakout and tennis, which were completely dead, the ones I bought off eBay. And again, those needed completely stripping down. It's a shame I haven't got photos of these. It was a complete nightmare to take apart, take the potentiometers out of them, and take them completely to bits and clean the carbon tracks. But eventually they were nice and smooth. And we got to the last part of the puzzle, which was actually playing the games in that most of the games I wanted to play were now horrendously expensive. So I ended up buying one of these. It's a flash cartridge. So it's a uh, microcontroller, like, kind of like an Arduino, but I think it's more, more powerful than that, that I imported from Canada. And it basically pretends to be an Atari 2600 games cartridge so that it loads the images off a SD card which you can just see poking out of the bottom of the picture onto the Atari so that you can play all the old games that you used to as a child while saving the wear and tear on the very precious edge connector that the cartridges plug into. So lots of uh, gaming bliss playing Pac-Man. <laughs> or a, a very poor impersonation of Pac-Man that Atari made back in the day. So yes, it's many hours of fun reviving like, old dead technology. <laughs> sounds like it's quite an expensive hobby as well, Lee. Yeah. Uh, well, fortunately, I managed to sell the two because I managed to end up repairing all of them. Ah. And I sold the two of them to friends of mine who wanted to be able to play the games but without any of the hassle so eventually i only ended up paying for the you know the actual console and the spare parts to go in it rather than ending up with three consoles only one of which worked so no it's, it t turned out all right but yeah. yes it took a very long time to get them all sorted and working but it was the passion that drove you forward it wasn't yes, you thinking yeah. oh here's a way i can quickly make a make a little bit of money on the side oh god no if you want to yeah. make money this, this is not the way to do no. it because the amount of time and effort troubleshooting and desoldering stuff and soldering stuff back together again and scratching your head wondering why it still doesn't work and buying even more capacitors and even more resonators and, and eight sets of joysticks to create a working one it's it's, it's not a way to make money it's definitely Definitely a risk. passion. Fraught with risk as well, because there's no guarantee it's just going to work when you oh, put in the new components. No. Ab absolutely, yes. Yeah. I mean that that chip, if you can't if you couldn't get hold of one of those chips, that, that's basically it for the console. It's it's a very nice looking dead games console. Yeah. You could always put it in a glass case and then mount it on a wall or something and yes. whenever people come round to your house, like, ooh, you know. Yes. Um, that's exactly what my wife said. That yeah. I should, shouldn't have bothered doing this and should have just nailed it to the wall and it would have looked pretty. <laughs> and, and of course, there are a few places you can go and visit, like the National Museum of Computing, Bletchley Park. The, there's the uh, National Science and Media Museum in Bradford, where they have working versions of these that you can experience some of it. And there are, some of you will be oh, able yeah. to add in the chat, there are other places where people can go and... Oh, yeah. We the, live. These. And you can also, have you seen these uh, modules you can buy? I, I just happen to have one somewhere behind me at the moment. They're about £5 and you can plug it into your TV 
and it has a lot of these games on. Oh yeah, yeah. it's not it's not the same. Of course, it's Whatever not the same. Is, you you can play the game on a Raspberry yeah. Pi, and it will look right. it'll look much better than the picture coming out of this Atari yeah. wheel. But it's, it's you're the, right. It's, it's the joystick and the yeah, and the uh, two hundred hours of f- troubleshooting and fault finding <laughs> to try and get it back to the condition <laughs> it used to be in. Yes, yes, absolutely. But and there's people, there are some people, and I know of one who lives near me in Longridge called Dave Williams, and they, I think it is actually part of their income. They do buy up these old computers and consoles and then restore them. Um, there's one, if I put his Twitter handle, it's Devilish Designs. I was hoping I could tempt him to come along and join us tonight. I'll just post it into the chat. But he um, he regularly shows, shares photos of, of computers and old consoles that he's restored but lee thank you thank you for helping some of us relive our uh childhood memories somewhat briefly but reminding us about the practicalities like old and owning an old classic car they, they look very nice but yes. there's a lot of uh time and effort energy yes. required there's more time spent fiddling with it than there is playing the games in it yes <laughs> Or more time spent fiddling with a spanner than actually driving the thing in the case of old cars. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you, Lee. And we're going to go over to our next lightning speaker now, who's Gary. Um, and I'm waiting for Gary to turn on his microphone and camera. And so, Lee, you I think you've been joining us regularly since we went with the online jams. I think maybe yeah. April 20. Yeah, Is absolutely. That- I used to go to the... Used to still would if it were there the raspberry pi jams in milton Keynes, yeah at, 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 at the, the national at museum. museum of computing That's yeah right. and when that all stopped i was looking around for something else to do and there was the preston jam yeah and do you do you go to the museum often yourself yeah yeah it's one of my favorite places along yeah. with the talking of other places to go the center for computing history in cambridge cambridge yes they also have a fantastic collection yeah i'm starting to wonder if gary's fallen asleep he got no, really... i'm still i'm here oh can you hear me? we can yep. so yeah. we just need uh if you do the screen share then gary uh yeah it, it, i think lee has still got control yeah well you can do that yourself oh okay yep i'll stop share there we go okay okay so Lee, will you do you know if you'll be around for the jam jar session we'll be having later yeah. on? Yeah. Yeah. So definitely. so people can come and join us there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. Right. So Gary, I'm going to spotlight Good your nice. camera now. Thank you, Lee. Great. Okay. I'll take it away from here then. So um yeah, Alan announced um with uh, last month was uh, we were going to be doing dead tech this month and that was actually quite soon after I just finished clearing out my garage and thrown away a load of dead tech. Uh, and actually, up until a couple of years ago, I even had computers going back as far as 1979. Uh, the old NASCOM 2, if any of you remember that, that was pre-BBC. Um, but it's all gone now. I uh, took it down the tip because I decided no, no one would ever want to see that stuff again. And uh, so off it went. So, yes, um, Alan was quite right to point out earlier on. I did leave things pretty much to the last moment that, um, today because it was only um, this afternoon I was starting to think ahead to Christmas. And I came across this, which um, is a rather sorry looking sight at the moment because it had all its stuffing, stuffing taken out. But um, it's a stuffed reindeer head, obviously not a real one, uh, which I bought in the sale at Dunelm about three years ago after Christmas. And what it used to do originally was um, it would um, sense if there's anybody, you could be mounted on the wall and then it senses if anybody's walking by and then it would sing a Christmas song. Um, and I thought, well, that, that, that's the sort of thing that's ripe for um, modifying. And uh, so, as you can see, I took all the stuffing out and stripped it down and, um, and then left it at that. It's got distracted, distracted by other things. So it's been knocking around in a box now for a, for a couple of years. And I thought, well, this is an ideal opportunity. I mean, you know, it doesn't get deader than this uh, when it comes to, uh, to dead tech. And um, so I thought, right. We'll, we'll seize the bull by the horns or the reindeer by the antlers and uh, we'll see what we can uh, do with it. So the first thing I wanted to do was to be able to actually control the, uh, the mouth um, and, and get control over it myself. And the original mechanism for it was this one here. And basically what you've got there is a motor at this end here and some kind of gearbox in there. And then these kind of plates 
that's open up. Um, and if you open it up to a certain extent and let go, it returns back to its original position because there's a, a spring mechanism, which you may be able to see just there, uh, which causes it to, to return if the motor goes um, stops applying force to it. So well, I thought, well, rather than playing around with that, I would um, resort to my usual favourites, which are um, uh, servo motors. I was thinking Stefan motors there for a while. Um, and I've used one of these robot servos, which I have actually used on my main robot um, before now, and just printed off some 3D parts for it. So you can see that it pretty much mimics the appearance of this one and um, the little plate things are, are, are pretty much the same size and they extend out from the axle of the motor um, by the same amount. So basically I can just take this original one out and put that one in. So uh, yes, um, when Alan says this was a last minute thing, I, I actually <laughs> designed, it and print, designed and printed those this afternoon. And, um, and then just basically all I've done there is just attach them to the, the servo and they're ready to go. At the other end, there's a, an Arduino um, and that controls the motors. So if I now switch it on and press the button. So if I now press, I've got a button attached here, at least I can get it to talk like that. So all I need to do now is fly inside the reindeer's head, which is here. Uh, the, there's, there's quite a lot more stuffing inside this originally. and as and when I finish this project, uh, then I will put something back into it and hopefully I'll be able to mount it on the wall in time for Christmas. But I thought it'd be a good idea to show this to you now because um, when Alan announces later on what we're going to be doing next month, um, you'll see the, the relevance of this. Right, so, okay, I've got the thing stuffed in there now. If I now press the button again, so you can see. Hello, everybody. Christmas. Okay, so we've got our, our talking reindeer head. Um, now, what I wanted to do was not just simply have it do what it did on the uh, originally, which was to basically sing songs whenever it saw people. I thought it would be more, more fun if you could actually have a bit of a conversation with it, perhaps. So, um, potentially, that's what we could do with this thing. We could actually uh, have, it, uh, have it listen of um, voice detection and maybe in, in, engage in a bit of conversation but until that point i thought well why not just have it throw out a few insults at people as they walk past rather than just the usual christmas greetings so what i did i'll just uh, go into share here and i'll show you there we go all right so i'm just going to share my sound with you now oh that's on actually so we should be okay right so if i now um play one of the sounds that recorded Can we hear that? Alan's wagging his finger. I don't know whether that means you can hear it or you can't hear it. <laughs> I don't know if your screen share worked in the right, way you let's, let's, let's undo the screen share. And then try it and again. Then, and then reshare and then, right, because we go. That's it. I'm, that's it. Wait, hang on, give it a moment. Right, now we can see the screen share. Right, so. Merry Christmas, you dirty animal. All right, so that works fine. So combine that with the motion of the mouth. I've not got this happening working automatically yet, obviously. Um, so a bit of jiggery pokery here. Move it to the right a bit there. Merry Christmas, you dirty animal. I'll try again. <laughs> Merry Christmas, you dirty animal. And one more time, because I'm, 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 no, I'm no piano player, so I can't move more than one finger at a time. Merry Christmas, you dirty animal. Oh, right. OK, we almost got it that time. Merry Christmas. You get the idea anyway, with some practice. But obviously what I want to be able to do with this is to be able to, um, to, to, to have it happen automatically. And so that's going to be my project for this month is to have to get the whole thing to work. Um, as for, for sensors, the original sensor that was on this, I think it was actually just a straightforward little um, infrared um, LED. That, that, it didn't even pick, pick up body heat. They could just see shadows as, as people... Um, pass, go past, not an LED, a photo diode. Um, but I have actually got some PIR motion sensors, so I might have, have a go with that and see whether I can have to get it to uh, uh, sense when a person's in the room. 
so anyway, anyway there's there's a nice little project um we're repurposing some of my, uh, my Christmas decorations and hopefully um, this year I'll have this thing hanging up in pride of place in my hall. And spook <laughs> visitors to your house at the same time. That's the general we've, idea. We've had a couple of comments in the chat. I'm just going to read one. So John McMullen was suggesting that the reindeer head may make a suitable donor head for a certain robot that you keep in your house well yeah well of course we yeah, we had a bit of a, a head theme last month and uh, there's no reason why it couldn't be put on there i have actually seen um, robots with reindeer heads on before now oddly enough and they, they i are think a bit, you, are you thinking of a eurovision song entry from a few years back maybe i don't know about that um but uh, yeah they do look pretty weird when you see animal heads on top of human bodies so uh, i'm not so, not so sure about that that might that might freak even me out but um, yeah, good idea. And, what was okay. the other comment? And, well, the other one is kind of sticking with freaking people out. Simon Walters has commented. It, he said it must be your ring light, but he yeah. loves the fact that it every so often it looks like the Misterons are moving across <laughs> your face, it just just as you did then that very yes. moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, I tried to position it better, but uh, yes, yes. Um, because I was in a rush tonight, <laughs> as you so kindly pointed out, <laughs> just been slung to one side. Yeah, and which I just hope that you there wasn't something more productive or useful you were supposed to be doing this afternoon. Yeah. Um, well, no. <laughs> what what could be possibly more productive or useful than than preparing for this? Well, somebody has just suggested that what you should have been doing was going back to the the tip to see if you can get the the NASCOM two back and. <laughs> <laughs> refurbishes and then sell us on or something yeah yeah don't know so, have you given a little bit of thought to the suggestion i was saying earlier that we could for our december jam change the format as we've done once and and i know you had some you were a little bit skeptical the last time we did this where we basically put people in a breakout room at the beginning we give them a brief yeah. and they have to kind of talk to each other using the the video conferencing facility develop their ideas yeah, and then yeah, reconverge yeah. back at the end yeah yeah for this Christmas reinvented. Yes, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm still skeptical. I mean, what my, <laughs> I'll, t I'll, t I'll outline what, what I had in mind when I was thinking about Christmas. Really, I mean, it would be great if we could get more young people doing presentations on this. Now, part of the problem for them is at school time, and uh, which is very time consuming. Um, but also, some of the projects that we show the sorts of things I do and so on. They, they take a lot of time, they take a lot of money um, very often. And, um, and also they require some expertise outside of the kind of stuff that you would normally expect, you know, because most people who come to this um, jam can code, but they're not necessarily feeling confident about electronics, for example. They might be happy enough to say, link up something like a, an LED or a, a string of LEDs or whatever to their computer, but but really the, the coding side of it is what interests them. So I thought, well, why not have a theme whereby we have this Christmas reinvented thing and what um, people can do is they can bring them, whatever it is, whatever their skill set is, they can bring that to bear on Christmas. And it'd be quite nice if they could perhaps uh, reuse stuff because obviously you know we've got COP26 going on at the moment so we all need to be doing our bit so you know people could produce fairly sophisticated projects I mean this thing that I'm working on now you know it's going to take quite a lot of effort if it, if it eventually does all the things I want it to do um, but you could do something much simpler which could be very effective I mean I've got in my loft um, some baubles which look like disco balls and I think to yourself well you can attach one of those to a little motor and have it <laughs> spin round, which was quite good fun, you know, to have it come on at particular points. But you don't even have to have a physical interface that's electronic. You could, for example, if you've got an old advent calendar, you put away with the Christmas decorations or buy a cheap one. Sometimes you can get it for a pound or two from the, from, you know, some pound land somewhere. Maybe or you eat all the chocolate out of it. Or, well, I guess. of course, <laughs> yes. Take the front off and then actually physically stick it onto your computer screen, sell it or something. And then where the windows appear on the, um, on the calendar, all the little doors, you could then program your computer so you've got little kind of animated things going on behind them so that each day you open one up. You could even randomise it so you even knew the programmer wouldn't know what was going to come. So, you know, something like that is cheap and easy to do, but that would be great fun. So I just thought, you know, and, and anyone could do it. And you could do it to a really sophisticated level if you wanted to, or you could do it, you know, 
fairly simply, but everybody's got a chance there to make an impression and to be able to do something. So um, that was what I had in mind uh, when I kind of threw out those ideas earlier on. Uh, so take it or leave it. <laughs> well, we've just recorded all of that, so we might use that, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Nick, we, you know, uh, uh, for the start of our next jam. Gary, thank you again for okay. not disappointing us and bringing along another <laughs> almost complete project. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the barbs. <laughs> um, no, that was, was it not the burbs? Uh, okay, that was you, the previous month. Yes, I'm sure. Right. Oh, right. I, need to, I need to put my jacket on now because I'm going to head over to Todd Midden for the, for, for the next section of our uh, jam tonight where we're going to go and meet our special guest. So at the moment, I'm in Preston. And I can see I've got a jacket over there. So just give me a moment while I um, set a few things up here. So I've got a video I can play while I'm getting ready. Uh, duh, duh, duh. Give me a moment. I had all this ready, of course, so it would look nice and smooth. But of course, I um, got distracted there talking to Gary. So let's make sure I choose the right video. And this is the one. And here we go. Kindness. Oh, look at that pretty bunting up there. Wow, look at this. It might be hard to read this on the video. The Makery. That's where I am. Today, I'm at the Makery in Todmorden, which is this fantastic community centre. I think it used to be a college at one point. I don't know a huge amount about it, but there is something I want to show you. If you follow me back, so there's like a soft textiles kind of workspace mm -hmm. here. And then as I came in, I thought, whoa, look at these door closing mechanisms. Very, very powerful. I, I think they're there because maybe one day somebody's going to come up with an idea for a project that could use some powerful leverage mechanism. Now, we're going to go into Todamadin Tool Library, which is, you may have heard and read about these kind of things. So there's a local person. <clears throat> Notice that the audio has changed. A local person has come up with this great idea where you could borrow items from a library, not books or audio books necessarily, but tools. And they've got the instructions and all these kind of things. What a fantastic idea for a, for a community to have a resource like this available, including ladders and other power tools that are... Look at the length of that. That must be for lopping things that are very, very high up. Wow, and it's so convenient to have this next to this make space here. So there's a huge big table, and you'll see if you look around, you'll see various little hints to projects that people have been working on. This one really keeps attracting my attention. It's like a, a shelf of dead or unwanted appliances that at some point. Somebody may, be, or, or maybe that's not, maybe that's just their kitchen where they store all of their things. Look at this. Um, now, some people think if you have an old computer, the best thing you can do is rip it apart and take all the bits out and create some kind of fantastic sculpture. Yeah, you could do that, but that would be a bit of a shame if, in fact, let me talk about these. So this is the reason why I'm here today. So I'm going to move over here. So, so. I'm actually pausing that video just there for now. And I'm saying I'm going to shout out to Mick. Mick, are you there? Hello, how are you doing? Hello, good evening. So we just played that two minutes of a video there where I came over to visit you in Todmorden. And I'm just going to mention a couple of things while you get everything ready. So for, for people who've never heard of Todmorden that might be watching this, well, it's a town, uh, I would say maybe a, maybe perhaps a mill town, and it's located right on the border of Yorkshire, Lancashire, and the Greater Manchester area, and uh, it is in Yorkshire. And Todmorden's fairly well known for a number of things that have happened, and one of the things that Todmorden's become more known for recently is about these kind of community initiatives, how the community have kind of really joined in together and made things happen. And Mick, you you yourself, you're what, what are you a custodian there? Are you based there? Are you, what is your role in Todmorden at this place? Let and tell me about the place as well a little bit. Okay, so I think it, the most exciting thing about um, 
the maker space, the makery there, is the, it's very general purpose and it's really aimed to be open to the whole town as a community resource. And one of the reasons for that is because the place that it's in, Todmorden Community College, um, I think is the only space that's a huge old community college uh, that's been transferred from the local authority into local hands. So it's like a non-profit or local organization that have taken this on. And when that happened, I went along to them and I said, well, I'd like to volunteer to do some code club and maybe a bit of media making. And they said, oh, well, that's, that's nice. Here are, here are our room rental rates. And I was like, well, that's no good. I'm volunteering my time for free. Why can't I have the space for free? And I realized that um, they weren't able to do that, but that there was really a, a place for that kind of volunteer run space to happen within there. So we've got a great space within there. And now when people come through our door and say, hey, I've got something that I'd like to do for free, we can say, yeah, um, please do. Uh, we'll help pe to find people to come along and, and do you need any resources as well? Because we might be able to, to help out with that as well. So on the day I visited, um, I, I came into what I would say looked like an old college building. When I say old, I mean such a 1950s, 1960s, something like that. And yeah. a lady met me and I, I signed in at reception and there was all these kind of posters advertising things like yoga groups and language classes. And it seems to be a real community based learning center where yeah. you might have people running their own kind of business or perhaps a community kind of initiative. Is, have I got it right? Is that? Yeah, that? I mean, it's an old adult education college. So mm -hmm. it's the kind of place that in, in 1984 would be totally packed full of people doing art uh, classes, art degrees, pottery, cooking, a really vibrant uh, part of the town. Now, unfortunately, over the last 30 years, those kind of spaces have been really run down and underfunded uh, until finally they were going to build a, a little, uh, sorry, an Aldi um, petrol station and car park on this spot. And the town had to get together and, and do a massive Save Our College campaign and say, we can actually provide the kind of uh, things that used to happen in an old community college um, in, um, in a bit of a different way through like social enterprises and through volunteer run projects as well. And, and actually since you last visited, even more projects have started to, to come and, and uh, there's like a big climate college uh, project that's happening within the space as well and it's really starting to be a um, you get a sense of how vibrant it's going to be um, even now it's vibrant but in a, in a, in a year or two's time it's going to be something very special indeed. So I think it's perhaps worth saying at this point that you do have another day job at the same time okay. yeah. which is working in teacher education. Yeah that's right yeah and, and so what I'm really interested in in uh, teacher education is project based learning. So um, I've done all sorts of community work and all sorts of adult education work. Um, and Manchester Met Uni um, brought me in after I'd done a computing PGCE uh, to do community based project work with education students. So getting them out and about out of the university, working with local educators in a community setting and like, um, in a way, it's like quite an entrepreneurial approach. It's like, well, what's what's missing that's out there? What do we need to, to get it started? And I work, um, worked with students to kind of, um, to actually go and do projects within the community too. And, and that was one of the, um, one of our brilliant audiences for that were home educated families. So we bring those guys into the university, do a lot of um, coding, uh, electronics, physical computing, um, textiles and technology. And it was really from that that I started to realize um, the kind of, uh, that that was really what I loved in, in a lot of ways, that kind of um, project-based approach to, to learning things through, through taking part and, and learning through doing. Um, and it also hooked up a bit with my own kind of environmental interest that we were that we're really touching upon here with dead tech because what didn't seem quite right to me was that um all of these lovely um physical computing kits were all made in factories in china and then shipped over 
and yeah, they they're pretty pretty good, but like um, all that they didn't seem didn't sit, sit that didn't sit very well with me as well. And there's another thing I think that that's useful to I think to highlight at this point. So we talked about your day job, we talked about the the volunteering and community work you do, and you're also yeah. studying for a PhD as well, and you've managed to find a way to link them all together. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of. Um, that's been really helpful as well in terms of um, uh, I do you know what I find is really important is just to try and make those connections between different parts of your life. And there was a bit of a, a moment where um, my teaching at university moved in a direction that was a, a little bit disconnected from that kind of project based approach. So what I'm able to do is to um, in this maker space and making space. Um, bring in the work with um, family, learning, uh, an accessible approach to um, teaching technology and also environmental interests in terms of working with reclaimed, uh, repaired and recycled electronics. It all kind of wraps up in one. And so, yeah, like since this project's been um, underway, uh, there's a real sense of connection there. So I'm really enjoying that part of it. Um, so, and I know that we, we kind of um, uh, connected through uh, the love of kind of reusing old laptops as well. And um, that's something that um, is a big part of this space in terms of taking people's older bits of technology and giving them a new lease of life, whether it's putting Linux on laptops and installing all of the kind of software that you'd need to make it a really interesting educational toy. Or, or, or whether it's just, um, um, yeah, any kind of um, domestic appliance where you're learning about electronics through repairing things. Um, I think there's this something really interesting about um, that kind of crossover between repair culture, but then also the family learning as well, the kind of things that happen at uh, Raspberry Jams and uh, Coda Dojos and, and whatnot. One of the lovely uh, ways of looking at this as well as we often use tools digital tools like tablets and laptops as vehicles or platforms for our learning but also we we were discussing earlier and in our conversations that the objects themselves can become objects that we learn about how these things are constructed Am I right in thinking you've got some slides and images you, you want to share with us or should we carry yeah, on? I mean, in some ways, I, I think I quite like it that it's conversational. So I don't want to get too, too um, slide showy, but um, the, the kind of um, I thought it was nice to really celebrate recycled laptops and like the power of Linux. And um, I really like the marketing job that Raspberry Pi had done. And um, uh, the, the fact that they were using Debian was amazing to me. Um, uh, I come from a background of writing free software documentation. So the fact that you could run all of those brilliant um, free software tools for making videos and audio and uh, web coding, uh, the fact that that was, that was all on there was just great for me. So I thought, well, let's do a little bit of sisterly um, branding as well and come up with a system called Strawberry Tarts as a kind of uh, sister project to Raspberry Pi, where the Tarts here stands for like the adaptable recycle teaching system. And so um, just created a website, just promoting this idea of um, taking old laptops, putting uh, educational software on them and um, just uh, branding them a bit. Um, so all, all of the, the laptops that you use have got like a nice big strawberry on them as well. And, and I, I kind of explain the philosophy behind it and also kind of share a bit of documentation about all the different bits of software that, that I've found over the years are great for, for education and to promote that a bit. So the, the day I recorded the video, which we watched a few moments ago, um, we were doing a bit of a laptop exchange, picking up and dropping off and, and all of that. And I was on I was on my way to Bradford where we were planning to and, and we delivered workshops using digital audio. So we we're using headphones and microphones. And while I have Raspberry Pis and Pi Tops, I wasn't convinced that that particular platform was the best one for 
audio recording, production, mixing, and all this kind of stuff. Whereas these netbooks have got those little jack sockets that you can plug into the side. So I, I, I've got a collection of these netbooks. They're dated 2011. So we know they're 10 years old. And they have all these stickers on them that says uh, something like runs perfectly or designed for Windows XP. And I've been running the Raspberry Pi OS on them, but what? But some of the ones I picked up from you were running this Strawberry Tarts, and it's just such a lovely um, operating system. And y y you've you've based it on Ubuntu, is that right? Yeah, it's Ubuntu, but it's a low power one. And I think that it, was it Lee, or I think it was Lee who it looked like he was running Ubuntu Mate. As well, I'm not sure if that's true. That might have been Gary. But it's a great maybe. low. It's yeah. it's a great low power version of Ubuntu, that um is is fantastic to use. And I've just you know there's different flavors, but that one seems to work really well on the older laptops without losing too much of your usual desktop functionality. So yeah. So there if, are other flavors are out there for sure, but like um, it's it's a nice one. So if you're if you're running this. Cult, uh, curated or cultivated version of uh, of an operating system based on Ubuntu. It must be, is it hard to keep on track of it from time to time? You know, if there's new software updates or if things are not being used anymore. Do you, and, you know, let's say you've got a set of 10 or 15 of these laptops. Can it be tricky to remember where all of the... What I do is I kind of, Ubuntu kind of release a very stable version every two years. So every two years, I kind of go, oh, it's about that time again. Um, and I, I get the, the newest version. Um, I think it will be, um, I think it's every like April in 2022 will be the next time. And then I just go, go through and I check and see if all the different bits of software work. And really, I would say 95% of the time, they usually do. They're quite stable bits of software. Um, and then that's pretty much it. And what the, what I do is I make a, an image of um, of one laptop using a bit of software called Clonezilla. Um, and then once I've got that image, I can then copy it across onto the other laptops. And I usually do it when I'm watching a bit of um, a bit of TV in the evening, just kind of swap them over. And then once you once you've done the one, which might might take a couple of hours, the other ones just take about um, 10, 10 or 15 minutes each to just to copy things across. It's quite therapeutic in a way. So yeah, in terms of the investment of time, it's not, it's not too taxing as well to kind of keep, keep them maintained. And really, yeah, you can, I, I got a, that classroom set of 30 netbooks for nothing from a school who couldn't use them because it took eight minutes to boot into Windows. And so sometimes these things are out there and it's worthwhile seeing if you can kind of pick them up when, when, when you can have them. Um, we're also at the Makery working with a project called Techtastic that over lockdown gave out about 100 different laptops to um, school children as well who, who needed them and, and they distributed those through schools. And so this idea of um, getting out um, recycled uh, laptops to, to families that need them as well Kind of like really fits in with the ethos of the, of the space. Um, yeah. So one of the things I was going to show you, perhaps if if I've got a moment, is I'm going to show you some of the photos when I was using these laptops oh, um, right. in, 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 in the week before. So just give me a moment. I'm just going to take over the share screen for a moment. Yeah. And. Yeah. So the I can go full screen on these photos. So so here's one of these netbooks, and this was during the Bradford Science Festival, and we were actually using a live online version of Scratch. It runs in a browser, Scratch three, and it's great if you've got a really good internet connection that doesn't time out after 30 after 30 minutes which i realized on the last day that's what was going on so um 
we've got here they're a very small form factor they're great for smaller hands not so great for 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 bigger adult hands and um one of the lovely things you can just plug the microphone headphones in, into them quite easily low cost ones and we were using there's as, as i mentioned there scratch in a browser um so we, we used we had a mix we had some of these laptops were running the pi top os and some were running your strawberry tarts and um they, they work brilliantly. We, we didn't shut them down and restart them or, or get people to log in or log out. Um, some people had Scratch accounts and they decided they were going to sign in using their Scratch accounts. But um, for, for pretty much everything we were doing, you, you, there was nothing that really indicated or gave you the idea that these laptops were 10 years old or so. So I'll, I'll just switch that share off now. So it was... They were perfect for what we were doing in that lap in that session at the Science Museum. So, Mick, you, I, I, I met up with you earlier on, and you were telling me about some other projects like unmaking, and you were showing me some of yeah. these. Okay. So this really relates to. Um, I'm really glad that kind of Gary was talking about um, reclaiming dead technology and re purposing it because in some ways that's the um i kind of started a, um, a social enterprise uh, a while ago with um someone you might know called steve summers from noisy toys he does a lot of work around museums and make affairs um and the one thing we really love is unmaking so this is where um you just get kids and grown-ups taking things apart and, and one of the most successful projects we did was just a pilot in Hebden Bridge um, at the makerspace there before we had our one, working with families, taking apart computers, using um, tools, wire strippers, wire cutters, and um, just the level of engagement was huge. Um, and they can see here, you might see here down there, there's a, um, a CD, quite like CD drives are great to take apart. And so we thought, well, what, are we going to do with these components? And we decided that, um, in fact, um, someone someone gave me a heads up. I said, I'm really interested in working with these different components. I'm not sure the best way of doing it. Someone pointed me towards a thing called um, scrappy circuits, which look a bit like this. They've got, got bulldog clips and you kind of take apart tea lights and you make your own circuits by uh, connecting up with crocodile clips. And we decided to kind of take it into the realm of taking things out of uh, toys. For example, this is a, a toy where you've got four LED lights there. And you just um, you take a bit of time to solder up um, wires to these bulldog clips and put the right res resistors in place so that they don't explode. Um, and here's a potentiometer where you do the same kind of thing, wire up different wires to these bulldog clips. And then what, and a speaker from a laptop and uh, just a simple button from a printer. And um, what you can do then is um, that does a lot of the hard time consuming work that is difficult to do with young people or families in a workshop setting. Um, the easier bits are kind of connecting up bulldog clips and, and, and uh, sorry, not um, crocodile clips. And um, this is pretty familiar to us from using things like micro bits and crumbles. So what we do is we kind of use, we actually use crumbles for the most part, but also micro bits as well. We use these as a, a bit of a base um, to the last project we've done, we're, we're doing robot building using some of these, uh, you can see here we've got, I've got one here actually, see if I can get it for you. Let's see if I can uh, show you one. You can see the kids there with their finished robots. And what we've got here is, is a bit of a base of a robot. And there's a, a, a wheel on the bottom. And it's connected up to a crumble. And the first thing we'll get people to do is to um, just make the, the motor move. So let's give that a shot. Well, that's not working. What if I turn on the battery? Just see if we can get the motor to work. 
So even just getting it to wobble like that is a great first start. It's quite a wonky robot. It's made out of cardboard. And then well, what, what about if we put um, some sparkles on it as well? I'll give that a shot. Great. And you can see here what, what, what we've done with this one is uh, take a big old strip of uh, LED lights and just wire them into the um, kind of the, this kind of scrappy circuit onto the bulldog clips. Now you can buy, let's see, uh, in the box here, you can buy one of these from, uh, oh, it's disappeared. But you can buy these kind of sparkle components and that's fine. But making them yourself is a lot cheaper and for something like um, this, for example, this is great. This is just a motor that's come out of a, um, a CD drive. So you can get people to kind of stick a sign on there, spin it around. And that is a, like really a 100% reclaimed bit of dead tech that we're bringing um, into the mix. So you get young people taking apart the technology you can get volunteers or spend a bit of time yourself to kind of make these circuits. In fact, you know, that's a, that's a great way of learning how to do a bit of uh, soldering. An introduction to soldering uh, class would be like fantastic for, for making these. And then once you've got the kits, you then give kids the handout. And really we've been like that, um, the workshops we've done in terms of building robots have just been great. So you can see here the kind of the level of engagement and um, fun and um, just bringing a little bit of personality to your robot as well. You can see here you kind of put put a head on it like that. Please tell me some cardboard is involved as well. It's all, yeah, it's all cardboard and glue. And it's yes. all a bit wonky and sketchy. It doesn't all quite work. So there's engineering aspects there. You have to stick it together with uh, gaffer tape and all of those kind of, um, real engineering problems that you that you have, but in a, just a kind of um, um, with a bit of junk modeling form. thrown in as well. Yeah, 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 exactly that kind of design and modeling prototyping. It just seems just just about right for uh, beginning uh, beginning workshops as well. So I suppose that's that's the link really in some ways is kind of the the link in the unmaking to then the the remaking and um, design it's just been a, a, a really nice thing to do uh, this year to 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 do that and, and so sharing a bit of um it you can see how it links in to the idea that gary had for your christmas uh, approaches so you know we we're so up for like sharing the different um projects that we have and coming up with different ideas for how to do this um yeah it'd be amazing so i I'm, I'm not sure how many or if any of our jams you've attended before, but we have sometimes managed to link up with some of the other maker spaces and maker groups around the country. We've, we've had South End, uh, STEM Ets, they, they, or Essex, sorry, STEM Ets Essex have joined us. We've had a few other groups from different places. And one of the things we'll, we'll move on to in a moment is I have another video clip where we'll discuss ways that we might join together. Well, I've had a few questions while you've been talking, Mick, and one of them is, if, is there a way you could share or display that URL with, that links the documentation for Strawberry Tart? So Michael has oh, yeah, asked. Sure. So uh, the, you could copy it if you want into the chat, and I could paste that into the YouTube chat, or I think you had the link earlier on yes. the screen. Yeah, I think I've just I'll put it into the YouTube chat there. Okay, right. So I that'll think that should work. I'll just um, share You might not be allowed to share URLs in the chat. If you put it into the Zoom chat, I can definitely share that in there for Michael. Um, there was another thing I was. Oh, so because of Todd Murden's location, I don't imagine there's going to be a huge amount of people who are watching the jam tonight or the recorded version. They're going to be able to get over to Todd Murden. Where could they go and find out a little bit more to tease them or tempt them or at least show some of the activities that people could read a little bit more of? Because they might be inspired to organise something like that in their own space. Well, um, 
We're doing a lot of the documentation for these projects on, on a website called Scavenger Labs. Uh, so, for example, this one with the, the robots, um, I've, do, I've got a post for that up on there. Um, and yes, that's a good, so in terms of the teaching technology, we, we're sharing a lot of our things there. Okay, I found the URL um, for Scavenger Labs, and I will share that yeah. in a moment in our YouTube chat. I've tried to share it, I don't know whether it's coming through or not. Um, um, but yeah, the kind of in terms of the projects of unmaking and the repair cafe and the Todd and Makery, we've put, we've put all of those there. They're all um, on the scavenger labs. Okay. Yeah. And then in terms of the Todd and Makery, we've got uh, a website, toddwoodandmakery.org.uk. And that's a very much the community side of things. Um, at the moment, we're building that up in terms of getting more volunteers who are up for repairing things. Um, in terms of textiles, furniture, uh, computers, um, blenders, kettles, whatever it is. Um, and um, once we've got that up and running, we're also doing then kind of after school clubs as well. Um, that's, we haven't really got anything groundbreaking there because that's really kind of so well established in terms of like repair cafes um, and to be honest though that if it isn't broke don't fix it we could you know that's a bit of a weird thing to say about repair cafes but um you know repair cafes aren't broken so kind of the, 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 the one thing that we're doing is just doing it more regularly so we've got three or four drop-in sessions a week rather than doing like a repair cafe every month um it's so popular that it's a really viable community space um, rather than just a one-off event. And, and that's really nice to see that. In the video, when we did the tour, there was a tool library and you were telling me a little story about how this came about. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So the one thing that um, we've been doing pretty fairly regularly um, before this, before COVID, was a repair cafe. And when we, when we were doing the repair cafe, someone came in and, and you know, they're pretty busy things and it's all a bit, a bit hectic. But someone said, oh, someone said I should talk to you because I'm thinking of setting up a tool library. And I didn't think too much of it um, because, you know, um, that, that's great, but how do we fit in? Until we started to look at getting a space in the um, community college. And then that's when it became apparent that to having a maker space with a tool library within it is fantastic because um, you know when we've got these drop-in sessions, we, we can have open up the tool library and we can just borrow tools out of that for, for anything that we need to happen and then just uh, drop them back. Um, and then when the tool library is open on a Saturday morning every week, people come in and they borrow their different uh, garden tools or strimmers but they also see that there's other stuff going on in that space. They see that people are starting to repair old um, uh, old uh, amps and uh, starting Oxy to machines, do a bit vacuum of cleaners, yeah. of uh, furniture. And there's all sorts going on. And they like we've got a nice kitchen there. People hang around for a brew. Uh, often people bring a bit of cake and biscuits. And before they know it, they've they've been there for. Um, an hour and a half or whatever and, and now people start bringing their kids and the kids are playing with lego while they're getting on with their projects and what i think is really interesting um from if we take this back to an educational research point of view the idea of young people and families being part of a community an authentic community is super it's, it's been shown to be really important for project-based learning so the motivation for, for young people um, is much higher when, when they get a sense that it's something real. Um, and so to have this as a community that uh, young people are aware of as they're growing up, one of the reasons I'm doing this is, is for my six-year-old, so that he's, he's part of a community of, of makers and, and fixers. Um, and yeah, I think that's really um, hard sometimes to make that connection, sometimes between coding and electronics to... To, to a wider community. Some people just get it and they'll do all they can to find that community online. But for a lot of people, it's, it's more of a jump and, and this space kind of fulfills that, that role really well. Mick, um, what, I, what I'm gonna suggest that we do next is 
on the day that we met at the makery, we had some discussions that we called our jam plans. Yeah. And I think what I'm going to do in a moment is I'm going to start, I'm going to play a video of what we recorded when we discussed this. And it lasts about four minutes long. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to say, Mick, thank you for explaining all about the, the all the wonderful projects that are taking place in and around the makery. Mick, I just wonder if you could mute your microphone just for a moment, because you're getting a lot of echo coming through. And what I'm, what I'm going to do is in, I'm going to press play on this video in just a moment. And then four minutes after, <laughs> the video will stop playing. And then I'm going to open the jam jar at that point. Now, the jam jar, for people who haven't joined this before, it's a, there's, there'll be a number of breakout rooms. You should be able to join in. You go to different, there'll, there'll maybe be two breakout rooms you can go to and you can move around, mingle, chat to other people. But the reason I'm telling you you've got four minutes before, because some people might decide, oh, actually, if, if it's another video of Alan talking, I've seen Alan talk before and I've heard everything he's got to say. So maybe somebody might need to take a short convenience or comfort break while this video plays. And then I'll start admitting people into the jam jar. So I'm going to get the video ready to play. It takes a, a, a few moments for me to locate the file. And it's what we're expressing or discussing in the video is how we, we might link up more than one makerspace, in this example, Todmud and Makery, how we might link it with the jams that we're running. So I'm going to just put a message into the chat on YouTube with the link to join the jam jar. And now I'm going to start this four minute or so video. Hi, I'm in Todmorden, the community college, the makery, which is this fantastic maker space that I've only just discovered recently. So we put together a plan. I'll move around this side of the table. A, a, a jam grand plan. And I'm just going to run through it quite quickly what we're thinking of. So we're thinking of if this starts in January 2022, so we've got January, February, March, April, and you can work out the rest. We're looking at a cycle of three different monthly activities. We've agreed that, for example, the third Tuesday every month from five till eight would be a good regular window to stick to. So let's start with the big one. So we'll probably have three of these in a year, a big jam in real life which will comprise mostly of three activities, which I'm going to describe now for a moment. So the first one, people would turn up, perhaps at 5 p.m., for a workshop, which would last about 45 minutes. It's just a bit of fun. It's nothing massively complicated or technical, and it's one of those uh, low floor, not so much about a high ceiling. Then we'll have a short break, then the second hour or so, so this will probably start around six o'clock, we'll gear up for lightning talks, which might last half an hour or so, depending on how many we have. So if each talk is five minutes long or so, and we have five of them, then it would be about 25 minutes. And then the final hour, that would be like from seven to eight or so, we'd have a mingle session. And in the mingle session, this table that I'm at, it may even be that in here, over here we have Janine from Huffington, and Janine's got a project that she's working on at school. And then over here we have um, Michael from Macclesfield, who's travelled all the way to come here and he's brought along some robots that he's working on. And that's the kind of thing that would happen in that sort of legal activity. Although some people, parents with young families, seven o'clock might be, right, we need to get off now because the adults get tired, you know. Um, so that's the last session, and then when we get to about 8 o'clock, somebody might shout out, Right, who's off to a pub? Except, we don't call it that, we call it the jam jar. And it's an 18 plus thing that takes place after 8 o'clock at the, the local frog and bucket or whatever it's called. So that's the big jam in real life, which we think would happen about every three months, perhaps three of them in a year. People sign up for tickets, hopefully. They can turn up without tickets, but we'd encourage them to book in case there's any last minute changes. The next thing we've talked about is similar, but not quite as grand, which are these little jams that would take place Again, about every three months. They might follow on from a big gem. It's a much more loose, 
fluid thing where we say to people, just turn up and see what happens. If you've got a project you're working on, you need some help, that'd be great, bring it along. You don't have any projects, oh, look at those books and magazines over there. Maybe you could get involved in a learner-led project where you're steering, you're deciding what to do, and while you're there, you might get distracted by some noise or drilling and you want to see what's going on. And talk to people while you're there and learn, learn who it is that comes to you. So that would be much more loose, informal, that would probably the month after the Big Jam. And then the other thing we've talked about is joining up with our online jam collective. So these were originally designed for Preston, the online jams, but we've noticed we have people from all over the British Isles and beyond. We have a lady called Catherine who joins us from uh, Belgium and we have uh, people who join us from Scotland and we have people from Wales and the South Coast and the East Coast. So we should have people from Todmorden as well joining our online jam. So these will take place online as well interspersed between the others and what we'll do is we'll try to in these other events the in-person events we'll try to recruit people and persuade and encourage them to sign up to give a talk at one of these right i think that is the plan explained i think i've covered all the details okay so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to open up and allow people to come in and join. So um, I'm opening up the jam. And then one thing I will do shortly is I will stop the recording, we'll stop the, the YouTube live stream and everything from now on will take place in the jam jar. So, I'm still streaming live on YouTube at the moment, but we will stop that shortly. There are breakout rooms. If you don't know how to join a breakout room and you've got a modern version of Zoom, you find the breakout room tab and then you should just be able to go and join room one or room two. And at the moment, it looks like nobody's in any of... Oh, I haven't opened the rooms. The rooms are open now, so... Uh, anybody can join the rooms. You can stay here in the main room with, at the moment, in the main room. Everybody's in the main room. So people on YouTube will be thinking, what's going on here? I can't see anything because you're just watching a live stream. And I've got another window and I can see how people are joining in our jam jar using that link. And if you can't see the link, I can repeat it for you. It's http colon slash slash exa dot is forward slash r jam jar that's a seven letter word begins with r jam jar all one word and i've just seen uh, somebody come in and join that i've not seen for a while right so uh, what i'm going to do now is i'm going to go and stop the stream on youtube because we don't need that anymore so goodbye people on youtube thank you for joining us jam jar